Before we jump into the gravy, I just want to say I'm sorry that I missed the last two podcasts. I had torn apart my office to do some renovations and didn't have time or good space to do the podcast in. But now that the office is back in a working state, I've been able to set up my computer and get back to learning and talking about the stuff I find neat. That being said, this episode will only have two stories instead of the normal three, as I only had two days to research, write, and perform this. So with that out of the way, enjoy. Up next, building a rocket from the ground up using a Stargate? And how you can use your blood to fix a sidewalk. All of this and more, last week. Let's roll. Welcome to the Future Last Week, where we talk about all things awesome and futuristic. Last week, I'm your host, Wyatt, and it was week 25 of 2021. Ah, yes. Relativity space. Always getting ready for a launch soon. Relatively. But I'm not here to report on the failings of the company, or the slipping timelines, or anything like that. I want to talk about specifically tech. Namely, the tech that they use to manufacture their Terran 1 rocket. Now, if you're familiar with Relativity Space, you know what I'll be talking about. And if you're not, this may be surprising and pretty cool. Relativity Space is a launch provider based out of Los Angeles, California, where the air is warm, the weather is nice, and everything that exists ever is known to cause cancer and reproductive harm. Relativity is building a rocket known as the aforementioned Terran 1 vehicle, a small lift capacity rocket meant for things like CubeSats and other small payloads that need to be brought to low Earth orbit. Awesome, you say? Too bad I don't care. There are many small rockets these days either launching currently or right around the corner. What could make this one any different? Well, now hold on a minute, my astonishingly impatient listener. I haven't told you the juicy bit. What sets it apart from the others isn't design or capability or even a sexy paint job. It's how the rocket is manufactured. It's 3D printed. The whole damn thing. Every tank, every engine, every square millimeter is made with a 3D printer. Now, this isn't Aunt Jemima's desktop 3D printer. It's a very, very big one that lays down layers of metal rather than plastic and looks a lot different, too, being a robot arm on a set of vertical rails rather than a printing head on a gantry. And to top off all the concentrated coolness, the printing system is called Stargate, making all of the Jack O'Neills of the world very proud. Coolness aside, why 3D print a rocket? Well, it turns out there's actually a lot of advantages, or at least this is what Relativity Space says, and it's important to note in your head that they have yet to actually make an orbital rocket using this technology. They claim 100 times fewer parts in the vehicle, a 10 times faster production rate over conventional manufacturing methods, flexibility with no fixed tooling, and a simple supply chain needing just raw materials and some electronics. And all they need to do to make some improvements to the rocket is change the model on the computer or switch up the material type. Now, if you don't know anything about how things are generally manufactured, it may not be immediately obvious how such huge differences could be made just by changing up the way the rocket is made. Luckily, for my day job, I work in the manufacturing industry and can share a thing or two that I've picked up to help explain. So, 3D printing is what's known as an additive process meaning you make a part from the ground up by adding material. And in the case of relativity space, this is achieved by laying down layers of essentially what is molten metal. Now, about 99% of everything out there is made, at least out of metal, by a process called machining. Machining is what's known as a subtractive process, meaning a material is removed from a piece of raw material in order to reach the final shape. This is done by cutting away material with a hard, sharp tool like a drill or a tap or an end mill. The reason this method is much more popular is because machining is generally much faster for making parts versus 3D printing. Now, you may remember how I said that one of the claims is that they will be able to make a rocket 10 times faster than traditional methods, which conflicts with machining being generally faster. Well, I also said that the rocket would have 100 times less parts, and that makes a massive difference. Let me give you an example hopefully everybody can understand. 
It's a bright sunny day in Springley Vilton Portgrad and it's the annual hot dog eating contest. This year there are two contestants, Bob Weakgut and Charlie the Hog. Bob eats at a snail's pace of one hot dog every 50 seconds. And Charlie, Charlie is a hot dog gobbling god able to put away 10 hot dogs in the same amount of time. Because of this, Bob and Charlie are assigned handicaps according to their individual skill levels, with Bob getting 10 hot dogs and Charlie getting 1,000. I know this seems kind of BS, but just stick with it. The match begins and the first person to finish wins. Who do you think that would be? Well, Bob, of course. Despite the fact that Bob ate 10 times slower than Charlie, Charlie had to eat 100 times more hot dogs. Taking 5,000 seconds, or 1 hour, 23 minutes, and 20 seconds, to Bob's 500 seconds, or 8 minutes, 20 seconds. Hopefully that allowed you to see that even if machining is 10 times faster than 3D printing, it's much slower if you have to make 100 times more parts. One thing I didn't mention is that the reason you need more parts if it's machined is just down to the nature of how material is removed. And there are certain things that are extremely difficult to machine that would be relatively simple to 3D print. So to make very complicated parts in machining, typically they break them up into many smaller, simpler parts. And then they make assemblies to make the complex part. But as a result, that greatly increases the number of parts and decreases overall reliability. It seems to me that 3D printing is one of those technologies that changes the very foundation of society. The ability to make things with the strength and precision needed for an orbital rocket is a very necessary technology to our future expansion into the solar system. Instead of sending up many loads of pre-manufactured parts, you could simply send up a printer and all the raw materials needed for the printer to do its job. With capabilities like that, you would never have to worry about lift capacity or fairing size or anything like that, but rather how many launches you would actually need based on the amount of material. And if you can do that, you can build whatever you want. You can build ships, you can build space stations, you could build mining facilities, anything you want, in orbit, just by shipping up the material. That being said, if we could do that, that would firmly anchor us outside the influence of our home planet. So, if they can pull this off, if they can make the rocket, 3D print, have it work and everything, and then share that 3D printing technology with the rest of the world, that's game. That's it. They win. At Astra. Let's go for a walk, just me and you. Let's go outside and leave the safety of the stale Cheeto and Code Red dungeon you fashioned in your parents' house. If you are fairly observant, one thing might become immediately noticeable to you, something that most people don't really think about given its ubiquity in modern society. Almost everything you can see either incorporates or is made completely out of a gray rock-like substance. Buildings, sidewalks, roads, lampposts, drains. In fact, if we didn't have it, building a house would be considerably harder given that the foundation of pretty much all modern homes is made out of it. It's such a common material that 3% of the entire world's energy consumption is put into making it. That's 600 terawatt hours per year. What do you think it is? Well, you guessed it. It's concrete. It's cheap, it's strong, easily transportable, and it can be molded into any shape we like. And it's not a new technology either. The Roman Empire used it in the construction of many buildings and public works and things like that. Although their concrete is a different recipe compared to what is normally used today. It does have its drawbacks though. Research tells us that a massive 8% of global carbon dioxide emissions comes from the manufacture and installation of concrete. All on its own, concrete makes up 8 friggin' percent of all emissions of the entire planet and everything on it. If you'd like to compare it to something like aviation, which a lot of people consider as like a big emissions giant, that's four times more emissions than come out of all planes all year. On top of that, concrete is not a perfect material either. It ages, and it cracks, and it decays. But what if it didn't have to? Imagine you could 
cut down the carbon dioxide emissions from making repairs because there would be no need for the repairs. That's right, concrete no longer needs to pull up its pants to hide its crack, it can simply heal it instead. Using a special mix of concrete, researchers have discovered that they can get concrete to heal cracks in its structure up to 1 millimeter thick in as little as 24 hours. But wait, that's not even the coolest part. What makes the concrete self-healing isn't tiny nanobots or expanding foam or bacteria or anything like that. It's blood. As in that red stuff you have to wipe off the table every time you and your diminishing group of friends plays Russian Roulette for keeps. More specifically, it's an enzyme found in red blood cells that can convert carbon dioxide into calcium carbonate. So how does it actually work? Well, bear with me, this next part's gonna be somewhat wordy. Well, say you have a big concrete beam that's been around for a while and it's been exposed to the elements for quite some time and has started to develop cracks in its structure. Luckily, that beam was made out of our new concrete, and is already busy repairing every crack that appears. When they mix the concrete, they simply add the enzyme to the mixture and pour the concrete like normal. As soon as the crack forms anywhere on the beam, the interior of the beam is exposed to atmosphere. The carbon dioxide in the air reacts with the blood enzyme catalyst and forms calcium carbonate crystals, which then grow into the crack and seal up the structure, repairing the beam and preventing the crack from becoming bigger, thus saving the structural integrity of the beam. TLDR, the concrete grows new material to fill in the crack when it's exposed to air. Now, if you paid attention to the chemistry of it, you realize that once the concrete is cured, from that point on, it actually takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in order to repair itself essentially making structures made out of this concrete air scrubbers. But hold on, I know what's on your mind. You're thinking, look, even if it does, it's such a small amount that it's still a net contributor of carbon dioxide when you factor in the emissions from making and curing it. So if it is an air scrubber, it's the worst one ever. Well, fair point. But you'd be missing one important thing. Time scales. You can manufacture and cure concrete in the space of a month, and only gives off significant emissions during that one month period. The rest of the time it would sit and soak up the carbon dioxide from the air. Given the self-healing nature of this concrete, that could be up to 80 years, giving it quite a lot of time to make up the difference. So this is a super cool development and I can't wait to see it applied commercially, however this method is under patent by the discoverer. So it's very possible we may not see it out in the wild for quite some time. Oh, I almost forgot. I just wanted you to come out here and stare at some concrete with me. You can probably go home now. Thanks for the walk. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Future Last Week. If you'd like to support future shows and cool topics, leave me a tip. Just go to patreon.com slash tflw and I'll see you there. Rock on, futurists, and I'll see you next Monday. Spock, speak for the microphone.